Welcome back to the Speaking and Communicating podcast. I am your host, Roberta. If you are looking to improve your communication skills, both professionally and personally, and to improve yourself overall, this is the podcast you should be tuning into. And by the end of this episode, please remember to subscribe, give a rating and a review. My guest today, Micah Kessel, is the CEO of Empathable, a company that helps organizations gain empathy and shift culture to be more inclusive. He is also the emotions, empathy, and bias researcher who advises in design for labs at Harvard and Northeastern University. And before I go any further, please help me welcome Micah to the show. Hello. Hi, Roberta. It's so, so nice to meet you and to be having this conversation with you. I'm so glad you're on our show today. Your topics are very interesting, much more scientific. So this is going to be <laughs> very eye-opening and educational for us. But before we get into the deeper stuff, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> um, well, like, what can I say? I um, Yeah, I'm someone who really believes that human flourishing is um, about gaining empathy and understanding our emotions better. I really love the topic of how to improve our our life through um, the way that we interact with each, with each other because we're not solo creatures, right? We exist in a realm of other people. And so I really hope that um, you know today we can talk about how our interconnectedness, how our interactions, and how um, engaging with other people can improve um, can improve our own our own ways of engagement in our own life. Um, I can tell you that I'm a multicultural kid. I grew mm -hmm. up in many different uh, cities and countries. Uh, I've more specific. So I grew up in um, New York uh, in a very diverse part of New York and Queens, and then I grew up in a very homogenous white part of Connecticut. Um, then I lived in San Francisco, um, Amsterdam, The Hague, Ghent in the Netherlands, Hamburg, Germany, um, over the course of my life. And so I, and I've lived in most of those places for, for multiple years. So, you know, I've kind of been forced to learn many languages. I speak um, English, French, Italian, Dutch, um, Flemish, German, um, by necessity of needing to adapt. I've always been someone who's needed to adapt to different mm -hmm. cultures. And it's given me a lot of understanding of what it's like to step inside of someone else's shoes. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I used to sing opera. I started at the Metropolitan Opera as a child. Wow. Um, you know, a, a joke that I one day will stop making, but still enjoy is I'm probably the only person who's ever been on stage with both Pavarotti and Nicki Minaj, but not at the same time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that, you know, my childhood was in a in a high culture performance world. Um, and what it taught me was what it's like to step inside of these big immersive experiences, right? These opera scenes and sets are at the Metropolitan Opera are huge. And you have these audiences that would get really engulfed in these emotional stories. And these mm -hmm. stories are about people that chose to follow their emotions, sometimes for the better, sometimes against society, and sometimes for the worst. So mm. from a very early age, my religion <laughs> was these, you know, mythological um, lessons that were about the benefit and the perils of listening to our emotions and the immersive spaces that create that. And so those two things have always really fascinated me and they led to being um, an experienced designer, which I have done for organizations um, like Google, Disney, um, the Diabetes Fund, Microsoft. I've worked with governments on experienced design projects. Yeah. And it's always towards the idea of how can we gain more empathy? Okay, before we, we get to the scientific part first, I heard a joke I think it was a sitcom where somebody said there's a, a, a language called Flemish, which you mentioned. And they said, is there a country called Flem? <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and, um, mm, and speaking of Dutch, um, I, I'm, I'm from South Africa and we have a language called Afrikaans, which is a from the Dutch originals who came to my country. 
we probably, obviously, outside of this recording, we pro- you and I will probably, you will speak Dutch and I'll speak Afrikaans. I'm sure 80% of the time we'll understand each other. Yeah, I'll see you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now talking about emotions, I find that I'm 46. I don't know whether because I come from a different era, but I find that we now hear more and more being taught to listen to our emotions, listen to your body. When somebody says something, check how you feel. When you're in a job you don't like, check how you feel. Has that always been taught and we were just not aware of it or is it a new concept? Hmm. I think that we look at history in a linear way as if the knowledge that we've gained has accumulated over time. But I think emotional intelligence has always had deep pockets in certain places and certain environments. Um, Certain countries have built religions and structures that have allowed for more emotional introspection. Uh, Certain countries may be a little bit less. If we think about the Dutch, for example, and the Calvinist religion that created Dutch Protestant culture, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those, the way that that society has been created on some hands allows for deep thinking and the other hand asks for not deep thinking the idea that you know not everyone goes to heaven and you're already pre-chosen it's like all right well i don't need to think about that because i'm not going to heaven. what's the point (laughs) right so okay so that's a whole realm of introspection that i'm not going to consider you know whereas the catholic flemish right might um be more introspective because catholics have to think a lot about shame Mm. There's certainly downsides to thinking a lot about shame, but there might also be upsides. So I think every little thing about our environment over time, and even more granular looking at families and how families have interacted, mean that emotional education has been deep in certain pockets. Mm. Um, I think, I think. But, you know, the history of time does have improved education, right? Does have improved um, health and wellness, yeah also the exposure through internet social media Mm -hmm. there's just a lot of information circulating that's right we're sharing emotions on a more mass level um, than we ever have before absolutely Mm -hmm. now when it comes to empathy i had i've had several guests prior to this episode where the everybody now is on digital empathy digital empathy Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. take us through that what are your thoughts on that well I think that empathy is first of all a term that is highly misunderstood hmm. and I think it's defined wrong in the dictionary um, in the dictionary empathy is defined as the ability to understand um, what someone else is feeling yeah and The truth is that from a scientific standpoint, we'll never understand what someone else is feeling. We barely understand what we're we're feeling ourselves. We're (laughs) working towards, um, we, we, I think, are very much allowed to say that we are understanding our own feelings because of the way that, you know, political philosophy has created the idea of personal right to express. And so I can say, this is how I feel. And I know that you will see that as valid, right? But really, I'm hardly understanding even how I'm feeling. I'm still working through that. So how am I supposed to understand how someone else is feeling? Um, What I think empathy is, truly, is the ability to celebrate the validity of someone else's experiences. It's the ability to say that Roberta's experiences right now are as intricate and sophisticatedly different and you know, beautiful and confusing and joyous and sad and embracing as mine. And to take a moment to say, you're having an equally valid experience in this moment as I am. That I think is what empathy is. So the question is, are we able to do that digitally? Because I certainly can't understand what someone experience is experiencing or what someone's experience is like in Jaipur at this moment, right? Or Mm, in mm. Singapore or in South Africa, right? But I I certainly can realize that their experience is equally valid to mine and that it's equally beautiful and intricate to mine. Equally valid. 
So it doesn't mean it has to be the same for you to understand. You will, you must just acknowledge that it's equally valid. Or maybe even celebrate that it's equally Celebrate valid. it. Okay. Celebrate it. Yeah, yeah. The reason I'm zooming in on that, have you realized how sometimes, especially here in the United States, there's always, you know, you have different groups, you have different races, you have different uh, beliefs, political leanings, whatnot. You always have somebody saying, this is my experience. They're just saying, this is my experience. No judgment on it, nothing. They're just saying, this is what I've experienced. Then somebody else comes and says, oh, but I've had worse. Or somebody comes and says, oh, a lot of people go through worse. Why do you think you, Mike, has experience? Why should that sort of like, be classified higher or sit on a higher pedestal why don't i just say at this moment right now micah has experienced this and this is valid and that's okay why yeah. do we always try to top each other what is that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah because indeed life is not about a trauma competition right no one, <laughs> thank no you one's, no one's trying to win the trauma award <laughs> yeah i i agree um i think that we talk a lot about a sense of belonging when it comes to to the way that they affect the isms, right? The way that a sense of belonging um, is different if you're a different race, mm -hmm. gender, sexual orientation, physical ability. Mm -hmm. um, if you're neurotypical or neurodivergent, right? All of these things affect our ability to feel a sense of belonging um, and affect the way that society allows us to belong. What I think we have a harder time talking about is emotional belonging. And that's because there isn't one book written that explains what emotions are. We don't actually know as scientists really, you know, what what emotion, we can't explain it on a, on a physical level, right? Well. We can just say that. And they're not necessarily separate from thoughts or predictions. What, what our brain is doing is constantly predicting what's happening in the world around us. And for all of us, there are, in my opinion, are places where we do feel emotional belonging and places where we don't. And I don't mean places like in one person's home, I feel it and another person's home, I don't, right? What I mean is in one part of myself, I feel it. And in another part of myself, I may not. So I might have a lot of emotional belonging when it comes to the topic of, let's say, guilt, Right. I'm, I'm very easy. to. It's very easy for me to to feel guilty about something, be in touch with those feelings, be able to process them and be able to move on and, you know, go eat lunch and go about the rest of my day. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's very hard for me to process um, anger. Right. Maybe that's anger is something where I have very little emotional belonging. And it's because the environment around me where I grew up didn't allow me to have that emotional belonging for the emotion of anger right and these emotions oh, almost like for the anger to be validated and for you to be able to express and, and create us they didn't create a space for you to validate your anger and for you to express it in a safe environment and to be heard right. so that's the emotional belonging you're talking about yeah here's a typical situation right we're out we're having a you know there's a political or social media conversation Mm. And one person is, for example, a person of color, right? Um, let's say um, an Asian man, because that's what I am. So I'll speak from from that view. Right. And they'll say something about belonging as, as an Asian man. And they're talking about belonging in the sense of race and in the sense of gender, but really the intersection of race and gender in this case. Mm -hmm. And then let's say that a, a white person says, talks about their sense of belonging and you know talks about the hard things that they've gone through they might not be talking about the emotional belonging that is or isn't there as a white person right but they might be talking about the emotional belonging that was not there they weren't allowed to feel certain things right and that's a very valid thing to be upset about it's a very valid thing to be traumatized over right and so because this isn't a trauma competition in an ideal world we'd all be able to celebrate the validity of these different types of belonging and not belonging, and therefore really listen to each other better, take the time to listen better. 
instead of the other person coming and saying, hey, wait a minute, just because you think you're an Asian man and you went through some tough times, I've had worse times, the, the trauma awards again, because that's usually what happens lately. Yeah, I think we get very, very um, awakened. Um, well, I'd use a better word. Maybe we get very um, lively mm. when it comes to people that are posing very oppositional viewpoints as we are. But if there's one thing that I believe for sure based on the social sciences around around me and what I've learned from it, mm -hmm. it's that we can create radical change in our environments without needing to change the radicals, without actually needing to have those arguments. And it starts with two people in every room who are comfortable and inspired to speak up for the rights of others who are immersed in each other's experiences enough to be motivated to stand up for their colleagues. And it's not necessarily going to be the person that's being very oppositional and loud. They might be yeah. the most stressful. They might cause the most rage, right? Or anger. But sounds that's like Twitter. Right. That's not how we're going to shift the environment better, though. Right. Mm -hmm. We will shift the environment of bias and people being unempathic around us better by focusing on those in our world who are more open and willing to learn about each other's experiences with each other. When you say the next person in the room, is it, if you think about all the Thanksgiving drama in most families here, November 25th, and, you know, people say, you know, I'm going to go home and, you know, Somebody's going to come out. Somebody's going to say, I support a, a, an opposing political party compared to what my family has always supported. Or you're going to go home and, and, and one of your uncles or somebody's going to say something about Black people or, or whatnot. Are you saying that in those instances, you are more likely to get buy-in from your uncle? Because they are, they, they, are, they are closer to you instead of thinking, I'm going to change the world by doing the big things. I love the example you gave, Roberta. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> My um, so in this perfect example, because it's something we can all experience so well, what I'm saying is that instead of focusing on what your uncle is saying that is driving you crazy, I want you to look around the table and find the person at the table who you know is more open and willing to take time to think about viewpoints, more uh, able to hear and see and understand how you feel and adapt it. And try and help them become the second person in the room to speak up so that when you just say, when you say to your uncle, listen, what you're saying to me right now I find it offensive towards certain cultures. Instead of worrying about whether he's going to respond to that or not, you want to be able to get that second person in the room to say, you know what, that bothers me as well, uncle. We all mm -hmm. love you, but I also think that that's offensive towards other cultures because that creates a conversation partner. An example at my family dinner, I'll take you to a holiday dinner with my family and you can imagine sitting around the table and my cousins and brothers sisters-in-laws are there and at one point between the second and third course right someone says something unintentionally racist mm. and it gets quiet in the room and my brother I see him open his mouth to almost say something and then he sighs because he realizes that it's going to be hard to change this person and my mother steps in and brings you know the next course tries to change the conversation and you know it's like pages have been unfinished in an unresolved story that just pile onto the mountain of unresolved stories that make up our nation and our world a second situation right is one where one person speaks up and then we hear crickets chirping right and no one says anything afterwards that one person feels even if they're right you know or even if they're making a really valid point they're the ones who are going to feel like the jerk 
because no one backed them up. No they, belonging. They, they ruined Thanksgiving they, dinner, right? No, no like, exactly. They're all alone in this corner. Right. They've ruined Thanksgiving. The like you said, it's crickets, and that that emotional belonging. So they're gonna withdraw just right, to be withdraw. safe. Yeah, and they're gonna feel less safe. And they're gonna feel less psychological safety. Exactly. Now I want to go to a third situation. Let's pretend that you and I are at the office mm. and we're in a meeting and there's 10 minutes left. We're talking about project management. <clears throat> and one person says something unintentionally sexist. And then you, Roberta, say, for example, hey, I'm sorry to interrupt the meeting, but actually what you said right now, I found it sexist. Offensive to me as a woman. Yeah. Offensive to me as a woman. And instead of crickets chirping, I want you to imagine that I speak up too and I say, hey, I know we only have 10 minutes left of the meeting, but actually I find that a really valid point. And I think this is important to talk about as a team because I also thought it was offensive to women. women. That is the team that starts a conversation. Mm. That is a team that where you feel supported and belonging stays in the group. And actually, the person who said it has a much higher chance of feeling whole and feeling belonging in the group, too, because they will be engaged in a conversation where they can be brought back in. So instead of this one person opposing another, which will never create environmental changes and bias, having two people in every room that are motivated to speak up for each other's rights is how we're going to shift it. So even the most biased person... Mm -hmm. over time will become less biased and you didn't even try and change their opinion directly you found that second person in the room to help you speak up on a similar issue because they felt that way already right right speaking of bias oh sorry go ahead go ahead no if i'm almost an ally to women let's say that you you know me you know at work you were friends we get along and you think micah There's some things he doesn't understand about a woman's perspective that I wish that he did, but I know that he cares, right? I know Mm -hmm. that he wants to understand. Is it better to invest your energy in the person that is loudmouthed, that is totally sexist, that drives you crazy? Or is it better to invest your energy in me, you know, who you know cares, but is missing a little bit of perspective and understanding? The energy that you spend to immerse me into your experience of what it's like to be a woman will benefit you so much more in the big picture because I will become that second person in the room who's comfortable and motivated to speak up. And that's how we're going to change the other person's viewpoint without worrying about the loudmouthed uncle at the meeting, right? Yeah, because that's what I said earlier. The loudmouthed uncle sounds like the Twitterverse because right now it's going really crazy. Yeah. yeah. Now talk. let's talk about bias yeah happy to yes so what is implicit bias Mm. well one of our labs we like to talk about um bias with a big b and with a small b actually one of our lab directors dr barrett um talks about this bias with a small b is having a preference of uh, mint chocolate chip ice cream over um, uh, hazelnut. Almond, my, my favorite, right. yes. <laughs> we can also sit and talk about ice cream flavors. That's a great topic too. I'm, I'm For totally sure. All about that. Um, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, bias with a small b is, you know, liking dogs or liking cats and having a preference there. There's no harm from it. And it's something that we do all the time and we have to do it. We ha- Our brain is constantly predicting what's going around us, what's going on around us. And we need to be able to check some boxes to be able to say, you know what? I like cats over dogs. That's just how I feel. I don't need to overthink it. It's not harming anyone for me to feel this way. It's fine, right? That's bias with a small B. Bias with a large B is when we have preferences that um, create a lack of equity and a lack of inclusion and belonging for other people. And so, you know, implicit bias is when we haven't been able to bring the awareness of those preferences to a place where we can take time to think about them and be conscious of them, right? In the, I'm using conscious in a metaphorical sense. Mm-hmm. 
And so that's that's what what is challenging is that bias is historical and bias is environmental. And that's why it's so hard to be able to see the bias around us. We don't live in a vacuum. Bias is like a wave in a stadium. If you're in the 80th row of a soccer stadium, a football stadium, and someone stands up to do the wave and the wave is moving towards you. As you're going to stand up. Right. You're going to stand up because mm -hmm. of people around you that are standing up. Right. We don't know if you're going to stand up based on your personality as scientists. We don't know if you're going to stand up based on the amount of sleep you got. That's very hard to predict, but it's very easy to say you're going to stand up because of the people standing up around you. And that's why the environment around you will predict your behavior in many, many ways. And that's why implicit bias is so hard to see. Because mm. if you don't live in an environment where you have been able to immerse yourself in other people's experiences, then how can you possibly take their perspectives? How can you be that second person in the room? Right. And therefore, that means the environment, are you suggesting that we constant, not constantly, but that sometimes if we have a strong bias towards something, we sometimes need to check where that comes from, what might have fed that into us looking a different way, especially if somebody challenges us on, on what we strongly feel about a certain issue. Mm -hmm. If you think, wait a minute, I really, really detest whatever that is. Mm -hmm. If somebody challenges me on that, should I then take the time to just check and analyze where those strong feelings about that thing came from? Or should I think, hey, you know what? I feel about it. Leave me alone, Micah. You know, why? that's it. Yeah, there's not, you know, just like there's not one book of how the brain works or how emotions work, there's certainly also not one book of therapy or one book of how we work with our emotions. But I'm I'm personally of the belief that if we're having a really strong emotion about a situation, mm. that strong emotion might not only be about that situation, right? It might also be about... <laughs> there's something other, behind that, right? <laughs> there might be something behind it, right? There might be parts of us that need time to process. And so I would say most of the time, if we're feeling a very strong emotion around something and no one's in danger, no one's in actual physical danger or mm -hmm. mental danger at that moment, then yes, it can be absolutely great to take a step back and really consider what's going on and, and process. We call this in science intellectual humility, or you can even just call it humility. Like the more we know about a topic, the harder it is to for us to be humble about it. If we think we know everything mm. about it, about um you know knitting and crocheting then if someone comes in and says oh but have you tried this stitch it might be really hard for us to say oh yeah well no i know that stitch right but if it's something that we don't know a lot about we're usually more open-minded to hear it so that's the tricky thing if we think we understand how race works or how gender works or how you know what women are like or men are like or what non-binary people are like if we already have big assumptions about that we think we're an expert on it it becomes harder to take that step back and say i'm having really big emotions right now mm -hmm. they probably don't have to do with the situation so why don't i take time to process what's happening right and that's where empathy can be so powerful that's where we can instead of saying I, you know, I understand or I don't understand. What if we just say understanding isn't really the thing in question here because we'll never understand. And that's okay. Right. What we can do is celebrate how we feel as different and valid because feeling differently about things is only good. We, we forget this, right? But we need yeah. to feel different, different ways about things. It helps us thrive. It helps us pro solve problems better. It helps us innovate as organizations to have different viewpoints and to have different ways of looking at life. Yeah, that's how they develop the product offerings for sure. Um, when it comes to, because I'm wondering, what is it that creates a fear in us so much of something being different, of a different person, different nationality, different gender, different race, different language? Is there a scientific explanation for why we fear difference? And because I mean, some people you realize that, oh my goodness, if we all spoke the same language, look the same, they'll be so comfortable in, you know, living in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Our, we have a limited amount of energy that we can use every day before we need to go to sleep, or, you know, if we overuse it, we might get sick. Um, and our brain is, you know, producing 
20% of our body's energy is going to our brain, right? All the time, mm. whether we're awake or we're asleep. Thinking is very expensive, biologically speaking, right? We expend right. a lot of energy to do it. Um, so what we have been taught to think about um, is going to be easier to think about. And what we haven't been taught to think, what we have not been taught to think about is going to be harder to think about. So, you know, if I've been taught to think about what different races, um, you know, consider on a topic, then that will be easier for me. It'll be less expensive to expend that energy because I've already created that pattern. If shortcut. I, right, mm. right. It's, it's sort of like a shortcut, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I haven't ever, you know, been taught to think about it, but instead, let's say that that shortcut goes from thinking about races is connected to being afraid. Right. So every single time someone has talked about race in my environment, they haven't said, I'm afraid. Right. But you've seen the fear. Yeah. The thing that you feel is fear. Right. You've seen their their body tense up or you've seen their eyes dart around. Right. Or you've seen their voice get higher. And so what that has taught me, the emotional education that I've received is thinking about race is a scary thing trying to help that person be not afraid of it means that the first thing that one of the things that needs to be in that beautiful concoction that potion is having their fear have a sense of belonging so mm. someone who feels comfortable with fear will therefore have an easier time looking at the other side of that shortcut and saying okay i can be comfortable with my fear so maybe i'm more comfortable talking about race someone who has been taught that fear is bad and that it doesn't belong will have a harder time you know by and large expressing that thinking about it thinking mm. about it, taking time to process it which is again why we will have much less stress as individuals in our world if we stop trying to change the people that we know that we think are never going to change the truth is it's not that they're never going to change. It's that they're not going to change by us reaching them directly as well as taking that same amount of energy in our bodies and going to the person that we know is able and willing to change. Now, the, going to the person who feels more belonging in fear and therefore talking with them about race or talking with them about what it's like from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Empathy goes to those who are motivated to be empathic first. And then we yeah. shift the environment with us. Mm -hmm. so what what when you do your research in the labs how how does that pan out well that's really interesting because the the research in the lab is research in a lab right but because you, <laughs> well, you, you're researching emotions i mean you don't have rats and feeding them a medicine to test a drug and you know exactly. the physical stuff so yeah. if it's emotional mm -hmm. How, how how does that what does that look like for somebody who, who's not in those spaces yeah so it, it pans out what it looks like is that we take the research in the lab and we bring it into the world right and we bring it in, that's actually where my work at empathable our organization comes mm -hmm. into play because what empathable is doing is helping people walk in each other's shoes as much as we can, right? We'll never be able to truly, just like we'll never be able to understand, but it's helping people celebrate the validity of each other's experiences by immersing them in learning, right? Immersing them in someone else's realities. So mm -hmm. the, you know, we see things through their eyes, we speak the words that they would normally say, and all of a sudden we understand more deeply what's happening. And we created this digital experience to be able to give people an understanding of what's happening in someone else's life, but also to be able to study what happens when we give people a more valid understanding of someone else's experience. And so that's mm. how we bring the research to life. That's how we say, okay, we think that giving people little doses every day of someone else's immersive experience right. will be more effective at creating empathy and making teams and you know a team could be a family or a company right but making teams strong 
than you know an hour long keynote uh about race um or gender or sexual orientation or any of the the pieces of identity the that other sense. yeah the, right. be, being an other mm -hmm. coming in and doing that you know for an for a school or an organization once every three months is not going to have the impact we believe that doing a little bit every day will. That's how we win a marathon, right? We run a little bit every single every day. We don't day. run 20, 26 miles all at once on one day. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we take the research from the lab. We know from the lab that really small doses can change habits faster than one big giant dose, right? Um, we know from the lab that the cure to the isms, we don't talk about it in a way that we can cure it, but if, if we can, the cure to the isms is contact with people who are different from us. So let's give people really small doses every day of contact with people that are different from us and help them see their perspectives by making that contact immersive, making that learning immersive. Mm. And then let's see how that impacts their viewpoints over the course of time, over the course of days and weeks and months. And we believe that this research and this method can be very, very powerful in taking away biases biases with a big b you might always love mint chocolate chip and cats of course but you might feel very very different about men or about women or about non-binary people or about trans people over the course of time if you have greater regular contact with that with someone from a different perspective mm. have you received any feedback on doing these immersive experiences with people yeah so the feedback, we've shared this experience with over 10,000 people, mm. um, maybe even double that by now. It's probably an old number. And from a just purely, you know, qualitative emotional feedback, people feel really grateful and hopeful after going through this experience because we're never needing to tell people that they're wrong. And we're never needing to tell people what they think. We live in a world where everyone's telling everybody else what they should think. That's why it's not working. That's why it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> right? But what if instead we just show each other's perspectives in a way that says, you don't have to think this, but I want you to celebrate the validity uh, that this is this is the experience that I've had. My experience. Mm. A great example. One time we were sharing the experience for a very small um, town uh, somewhere in the in the south and someone from uh, that team said you know the the particular experience we were immersing people in was one where you were walking the shoes of a black queer woman and she was talking about how nobody moves out of the way for her on the street and her friend you know walked in the middle of two people because she was tired of people not moving out of the way for her Mm. And this woman from the South who saw this said, I just think her friend was rude. We all have a fair chance. I don't get this at all. And we said, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Right. Very counterintuitive because in the moment, what I was feeling is you're wrong. The science says you're wrong. I've talked to over, you know, I've talked to hundreds of black women who have said, this is my experience. Same I, know, experience. Yeah, yeah. I know this is true. Right. But, or I, I experience it to be true, I should say. But instead of telling her that she was wrong, I said, thank you for sharing your experience. I really appreciate it. And so validate her as well, no matter what your belief system about her experience is. Right. Just, thank her for sharing it because mm -hmm. sharing if we talked about what is implicit bias right sharing your experience is the first step to being able to examine it mm -hmm. right whether you're sharing it in your own mind or sharing it with someone else so one week later we came back and we had a follow-up and we said you know how have you been what's been going on and she said you know i thought a lot about that scene that you shared with us in the immersive experience during impathable and I still think it was rude what she did, but I noticed that I've been moving down the street differently. Oh. And we said, oh, wow, thanks so much for sharing that. We didn't say, oh, you're a better person now and you were no, No judgment. In both cases, it's not a judgment. Right, the anger is creating judgment and the judgment is creating defensiveness and pushback. And as a result, 
we as a country and as a world are not dissolving our biases as fast or as well as we can. We have to stop telling people that they're wrong. We have to stop telling people what they should be thinking and instead show them, bring them into our perspectives, invite them to see our perspectives. And again, I don't mean the people, don't invite the, you don't need to invite the people into your perspectives that are driving you crazy and that- Into you know, one extreme, so yeah. Right. That's not gonna solve anything. Look for the almost allies. Right? Mm. That's how we solve the bias. Look for the people who are motivated and bring them into your experience. Do a cooking class with them. Go to a cooking class of, you know, go to a, a cooking class on how to do a brai, right? A, a South African barbecue. Yes, a brai. Oh, you Ooh. really know your Dutch. Yeah, yeah. let's do a brai. Right? <laughs> brai. Let's a, yeah, let's have the brai be taught by a South African mm. man or woman, right? Or non-binary person. That's great. That's giving me exposure to culture through food. It's giving yes. me more time with someone who's teaching me something fun, right? Which is, right, That that's contact. That is an anti-racist act, right? That is a powerful way to dissolve our biases. Take, mm -hmm. take a language class. How about instead of, you know, having the feather in our cap of saying, oh, now I speak... Um, now I speak, you know, German, or now I speak Swahili. How about instead of that, how about we take 20 language lessons in one year, but we only take the first lesson of each one? First lesson <laughs> so, of each of the 20 languages? Yeah, yeah. So Are I won't gonna remember, remember anything, Michael? No, no, you won't remember anything at all. But what will happen is you've had 20 points of contact, mm. with 20 people from that country, right, or from that, from that language, and it has increased your contact and understanding with different cultures. What is the more valuable lesson? Well, maybe the, the one will be better on your resume, but the other might be better for the resume of your soul, if you will, right? It might right. be better for the culture, that the, wor the world that we live in. You might have more empathy and more understanding. And I would argue that deeper empathy will have a more positive impact on your life and the lives of others than you speaking German. I don't think you speaking German is going to benefit you know, me speaking German isn't going to benefit Roberta that much, but me speaking 20 languages over the course of a year, not learning one of them, but having 20 new different perspectives will definitely... The, your empathy levels towards others who are different. Right. Yeah. Right. And speaking of it, so I was in South Korea teaching English for the past decade. I came wow. to Chicago two years ago. I'm half and... Korean, by the way. Oh, yeah? Really? Yes. Which part of Korea? Do you know where, where your parents are from? My my, my mother, uh, my amma, is from a small town outside of Seoul. Outside of What's Korea. it called? Because I lived in different parts. Actually, I don't, you know, I don't know. Because um, like many Asian women, the way that she talks about her past now that she's immigrated, um, you know, already for 40 years, is, um, is oh. not as, as abundant as, as maybe. Oh, she like. does? Oh, okay, yeah. Maybe I love she's more curious, yeah. Thank you. Jinju, Seoul, Pochon, Sokcho. Oh, I, I lived everywhere. Wow. But what I found was we see a lot of, our biases are usually fed by what we see in the media and whatever conclusions you come to based on that. But when you actually go and immerse yourself in a different culture, and you get to know people for who they are, not what the media tells you. It's a it's a completely different life changing experience. Mm -hmm. And therefore, afterwards, you no one else can tell you about that culture because you've experienced it yourself. Like I said, the the, the woman came back and said, "You know what? I've realized something." For instance, I I even had uh, Korean parents. If you teach in the private ones where they pay a lot of money for the English lessons, after school lessons. I had parents who, based on the way I look, they would think, ah, this is not the product I ordered. <laughs> it's defective. My, my kids' English teacher should look a certain way. And, but to this day, I have on Facebook, those who are old enough, obviously, because I taught middle school at back, back then, they are old enough to say, teacher, Roberta, I miss you. My English got better after you became my teacher. I went on to learn English in, in college, university. I'm going to be an English teacher. So their moms did not deter them mm -hmm. from liking me or from deciding to get to know me on their own, no matter what the mom thought. Mm -hmm. 
you see what, what, what happens there is that that one Korean kid decided, I, I don't care what my mom thinks about black people. My teacher is this way. I've met her in per, I've experienced her. Mm -hmm. And the, the parents, did they have that ability to do that because they have more belonging of different races because of other races that they grew up around or is it because they have more belonging of emotions because the families that they grew up around allowed them to feel certain emotions more so that they were able to accept and acknowledge difference as something to be celebrated and not something to be feared? Very good question, because usually how we describe Korean culture is very homogeneous, the history, everybody looked the same, so everything is different. And whatever they thought would make sort of a, a perfect English teacher for them is somebody who looked a certain way based on their race, of course. And therefore, they haven't, I, I don't think a lot of them have experienced either side or either culture or either race, but it's just this, I was made to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, as Brene Brown says, what is the story that we're telling ourselves? Right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, what, that's what I'm saying. I always think to my, my Korean experience as, as whatever Korean kid I taught, whoever as they grow up tells them something mm -hmm. about my race and people who look like me, they're going to think twice because they've met me in person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And Roberta, Actually, I think you asked before what what implicit bias is, and I just realized that might be a really good definition that's really simple is we like to ask ourselves sometimes, what is the story that I'm telling myself about something? Implicit mm -hmm. bias is what is the story I'm not telling myself? Right? What is the story that I have in my head? Yeah, I don't realize that I'm I, that that's the story that I have. right? What is the story about Korean people? that I actually think and feel, but I, I don't tell the, me and myself that story. And I therefore, don't tell myself, which means I haven't examined it. Right. I don't even know that that's the story that I have. Right? Oh, yeah. right. that's an interesting one. Hmm. The story I tell myself about, you know, uh, dogs, this isn't true because I love dogs, but the story I tell myself about dogs is that once upon a time when I was a child, I got bit by a dog and now I'm scared of dogs. That's the story I tell myself. Mm. Right? The story I wouldn't tell myself is when I was a child, I got bit by a dog, but I actually don't remember it. And so now I'm afraid of dogs, but that's because dogs are bad and stupid and mean. Right. That's what implicit bias is. It's realizing I have a story. No, it's not realizing that you have a story that you tell yourself. Mm. Right? That's what implicit bias is. The story you haven't realized you already have, you were just not telling yourself yet. That's that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Boom. Light bulb moment right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, yeah. Mike, oh, sorry, go ahead. The last thing I'll say about that is that's why telling each other each other's stories, sorry, that's a funny sentence, sharing stories with each other, right? Immersing ourselves in each other's experiences is a great way to open up the casket of the stories in our lives that might be sleeping. Right? Mm. They remind us of other stories and they help us think about those stories. And then the story that we tell ourselves about other people becomes deeper, becomes something we have more time to think about. And by thinking about it more, we dissolve our biases, most likely. Right, which basically is the goal. At the end of the day, if you examine our biases half the time, we even wonder, it's, you know, if you walked in someone else's shoes, you're like, what, what really made me think that <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. about other people? Yeah. 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 Last words of wisdom, Mike, I've taken too much of your time. Last words of wisdom before you go. No, it's been a pleasure being with you, Roberta. Um, I've enjoyed being with you too today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My last words of wisdom are to come away with this. Um, two in the room this idea of two in the room is a key that you can hold in your own hands that can open up the door to really the conversations that need partners again you know the perspectives that need followers and the ideas that need to be discussed mm -hmm. this is how we create radical change 
without needing to change the radicals around us. Right? Look around the table at any in any room, anywhere you are, and instead of focusing on the person that you have a hard time with because you think they're not going to change, focus on the person that you think is willing to change and is willing to see your perspective and then share stories with them, share experiences, you know, go volunteer for someone who's a, a group of people that are different from how you are. Different, yes. Expose the, go, yourself. Yeah, mm. Do the cooking class, right? Go to the book yeah. club. That's how we, right? These are anti-racist acts. These are these are acts that can dissolve our biases. Two in the room is how we do it. And it's a key that you can hold and then you can open that door anytime you want. Mm-hmm. Two in the room. Words of wisdom from Micah Cassell, the CEO of Empathable. Thank you so much for being on our show today. This was an amazing conversation. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Roberta. And before you go, where do we find you on the socials? On the socials, I think the best way to reach out to us is empathable.com. So, you know, you can reach out to us that way. Um you can find us um, really, I would say, because we work mostly with organizations, I would encourage mm-hmm. you to reach out to us on LinkedIn, actually, and look for Empathable on LinkedIn, or you can follow me, Micah Kessel, on LinkedIn. That's the best way to get in touch. Excellent. Thank you so much, Micah. Don't forget to subscribe, give a rating and a review.